welcome to the Tech Talk. Uh, thank you for coming. And today we'll be talking about optimizing every bit of your site serving and web pages using PageSpeed. Uh, I'm Richard Rabat. I'm a product manager at Google. And I'm Brian McQuaid. I'm a software engineer working on web performance. Uh, before we start, has anybody ever used PageSpeed? Can I show a, see a show of hands? Great. Perfect. Uh, this is the link to the Google Wave. Uh, we encourage you to look at it. There are live notes being taken, as well as uh, you can put moderator questions there, io-speed on bit.ly. And what you're going to get from this talk, quickly, this is a 101 kind of talk, so we don't assume a lot of pre past uh, knowledge in terms of uh, understanding of page speed and performance, so we'll cover some of the basics, but we'll also go into some more details, more advanced details. Uh, we're going to cover a few things. Uh, most importantly, why you should be here and why performance affects your site and why you should pay attention to performance. Uh, we're going to make sure you become familiar with PageSpeed and the, the new features in PageSpeed. And we'll also be talking about four new product features, namely export functionality in PageSpeed, the SDK, uh, an Apache module, as well as PageSpeed for ads analytics. We're going to spend some time looking, uh, talking about web performance. So I wanted to kind of give you, for those of the people that haven't seen PageSpeed, the brief UI, basically a bunch of rules and how a web page is doing against the rules. We're going to go over the details, but since we're spending some time talking about web performance, it's good to, for you guys to see the product first. Web performance 101. And here is you know, why, should, you mat why should, should speed matter to you? We know from a lot of user studies that speed is more people viewing your site, more people coming back to your site. Last year at the Velocity Detail Conference that's run by O'Reilly, we were uh, fortunate enough to have a number of companies actually share some of the data on, their, uh, on how performance actually affects traffic. Uh, so in, in, in those lists, Google ran what, what we consider a 400 millisecond latency increase. So basically, we, we took a bunch of people that we served more slowly by 400 milliseconds. And it actually like, corresponded to about 0.6% search decrease, which is pretty substantial for a company such as Google. Yahoo did a similar experiment. It actually hit their traffic by 5 to 9%. Shopzilla went a little bit further. So what they did is they basically re-architected the whole UI. And it actually contributed to about five second latency decrease. And they got a 12% revenue increase. Uh, and not only that, it actually de de decreased their OPEX cost because they needed to use less hardware to do the serving. So important things that you should worry about whenever you're developing your web website. So Brian? So now that we've seen why uh, speed, you know, web speed is important, I'll do a little bit of a, more of a deep dive into the technical aspect. Uh, why don't we start with the building blocks uh, of web performance. So there are three categories you need to be thinking about uh, you know, when you're thinking about web performance, sort of that end-to-end -end picture. That is performance at the web server, on the network, and uh, in the client on the browser as well. So on the server, really, the, the most important thing or the only thing we really we, we look at is that server processing time. How long does it take your server uh, to generate the response? So for a static resource like a file stored on disk, you know, you'd expect that to be close to zero. Uh, but for a dynamic response, you know, something in response to a user query, you might see uh, increased processing time. And we'll actually talk about, a little later in the talk, we'll talk about some ways to mitigate the impact of that processing time. Um, but that's, you know, that's the primary factor at the web server. And then on the network, the two factors, the primary factors are you know, bandwidth, or the contributing factors, bandwidth and round trip time. Uh, and then finally, we'll dive into those a little bit more on future slides as well. Finally, on the client and the browser, um, you're looking at parse time, so how efficient is the browser at parsing HTML? Uh, resource fetch time, you know, how efficient is the browser at finding and fetching resources? So we've seen a big improvement in efficiencies in browsers in the last 12 months in terms of uh, resource discovery and resource fetching. 
you know, previously we browsers had fetched JavaScript serially, so um, now most modern browsers, all modern browsers, in fact, in the past 12 months, uh, do parallel JavaScript fetches, which is a, a big win, and we're continuing to see improvements there. And then finally, the last two categories, layout and render, and JavaScript. And for most traditional web pages on the, on the, uh, out there, um, these categories don't tend to, um, traditional being the pre-Ajax uh, pages, these don't have a, as big an impact. But if you've got a large DOM or a complex DOM, layout can actually be a significant time, uh, time contributor. And then JavaScript, uh, again, if, you, if you're using a JavaScript-heavy Ajax page, um, that's an, uh, an potentially an important contributor as well. So uh, in those latter two cases, there's actually another tool, and hopefully you got to attend the Tech Talks uh, Google Speed Tracer that does a nice job at giving you a timeline and drilling down into the specifics of time spent in layout and rendering and time spent executing and parsing JavaScript. And I'd recommend checking that out. It's a Google Chrome extension that does a nice job. Um, so now that we've looked at the building blocks, why don't we look at an example page load uh, and sort of see how those building blocks come together to, um, you know, uh, over the lifetime of the page load. So we'll look at a page load for a Google search request, a, a search query for half dome photos. And what I'll show is we've got sort of three columns here, client and server. These are operations that happen either on the client or the server. And in the third column, we've got the render column. This is what the page looks like uh, as a result of these different steps along the course of the page load. So what we've done here is we've really slowed down the page load. Um, and, and we'll see you know, the discrete steps that we go through and then in turn what that looks like in the browser as a result. So we'll understand um, you know, how all these building blocks come together uh, to actually display the page for the user. So first, uh, first thing the browser has to do every time you, uh, you know, navigate to a web page is potentially perform a DNS lookup. Subsequently, once the DNS lookup completes, and that's, that takes about a round trip time, DNS lookup. In fact, in many cases, it'll take longer than a round trip time because you'll hit um, multiple DNS caches along the way. But roughly speaking, you're looking at one round trip time. TCP connection, connect to the server, another round trip time. And then finally, after those two round trip times, the client will send the HTTP request to the server. So, uh, you know, asking for that specific resource. The server begins to process that uh, query and, and we'll start sending back the response. And at this point, we've seen three round trip times pass. So, round trip time varies considerably depending on where you are, you know, how well connected you are on the internet. But you're looking at anywhere from single digit milliseconds on a local LAN to, you know, 10, 40, I think the average is about 70 milliseconds, up to you know, hundreds of milliseconds or even a second in the worst cases. So minimizing round trip times is a really important part of optimizing your website. So finally, once the response comes back after these three round trip times, uh, the browser can begin to parse that content and then we start to see the page rendering on the screen. And subsequently, more of the content comes back the browser continues to parse. And in this case, the browsers discover that there are four image resources embedded in the response. And so it begins to fetch those resources. And what we see is that the network stack goes and begins fetching these. Each of those sub-fetches is potentially going to incur a DNS lookup, a TCP connection as well. So you're seeing additional latency uh, uh, there as well. And then eventually we see these responses start to come back. And I'll, I'll mention to um, the gray section is the sort of off-screen portion of the page. So we're looking at the, the, the top portion is the part the user can actually see. What we're seeing here is that the page is rendering you know, that most important content, the user visible content first. And then the yellow regions are the current, the repainted uh, regions during that last iteration of the load. So what we start to see is you know, the image responses come back, they continue to fill in, and finally the page finishes rendering. So this is sort of how these different factors, DNS, TCP, uh, you know, client side things, parse, layout, uh, sub-resource fetches come together during the life cycle of the page load to, to sort of load and render that page. So in fact, um, typically, uh, you know, when you're performing a Google search, it feels like it loads, hopefully it feels like it loads like that. Um, but, you know, in fact, all these little discrete steps are happening along the way, and understanding those, understanding how they come together can help to uh, understand how to optimize the page. So given that, Richard will summarize. So 
if you go away from this tech talk and you need to remember like three, three things out of this. These are like the three speed guidelines you should like always worry about when, whenever you're developing a web app. And the first one is you wanna try to serve fewer bytes. And you're, you're going over the network. You want to try to minimize the number of bytes that you're sending over the network because they, they fit in packets. There are so many round trips. So the way some of the uh, ways that we suggest that you do it is by compressing at serving. Enable GZIP compression. Obviously, lots of people do it. Some do, still don't. Uh, if you have a web, host, uh, web hoster that is hosting your, your content and it's not enabling compression, move to another one. Uh, optimize the images. A lot of the images that come out of, of a camera are very wordy and verbose. There's like a lot of meta information that's un unnecessary. Get rid of it with a lot of open source tools. You can see a bunch of them. And also make sure that you're only sending the right size resolution of the image. It saves bytes on the wire, but it also saves uh, processing time on the server, on the client side. Get rid of all the content in the HTML, in the, in the JavaScript, in the, in the style sheets, that is something that you've put for development's sake. All the comments are things that your browser doesn't care about. So get rid of them. Use minification tools such as Closure Compiler, which is also an open source project. And also, cache aggressively. The way I think of it is the, best, the fastest serving is when you don't have to serve. That you know everything is in your cache. So see if you can push things earlier to the browser that is gonna, be, is gonna be needed a little bit later. So you're not waiting, the user is not waiting. So serve fewer bytes. Parallelize resource download. Uh, modern browsers use up to 60 parallel connections. Try to make use of them all. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about like one of the rules about like optimizing order of starts and scripts, which also helps in parallelism. And don't shy away from promoting modern browsers. Don't develop for the lowest common denominator. It doesn't help. Uh, push the envelope. If you need to support older browsers, check the user agent and serve uh, unoptimized content for that, uh, for that user agent. For example, don't serve sprites to old browsers that don't support it. But use spriting, image spriting, when the user agent can support it. So three things, serve fewer bytes, parallelize, and push the envelope in terms of browser support. So I know it's been a few minutes since we've started this talk, and people are anxious to see it. So uh, PageSpeed is, uh, is a, uh, it's a Firefox Firebug extension, and we have about one million active users. So for the people that haven't uh, you used it, download it, and join the fun. Uh, uh, this is our uh, site, go.google.com slash speed slash page speed. And the way you're going to use it is, this is the little firebug. And you, you start it up. Page speed is an extension in firebug. And it tells you about like the new features that we have. And the first thing you're going to do is analyze the performance of that page. So uh, I'm analyzing this page on code site, and it gives me a bunch of rules. Uh, the first thing you see is a score. A score is, a, uh, is something that we believe is good indication for, uh, it's a good metric that you can use that's, re re that's reliably reproducible. Uh, so you're getting about 82 over 100. We think it, it, it's OK. It's, a, it's an OK web page. And it's gonna, uh, you have a bunch of rules that you executed. And each one is going to tell you what, what the issue is. So for example here, uh, leverage browser caching. So all these, uh, a lot of this JavaScript is, has an expiry time of like one hour. You should look at uh, the expiry time. Do you really need it to be one hour, or can you push it? Can you, like, you, know, can you put it at 24 hours or seven, seven days? Seven days is a good time. You'll, you'll make sure that anybody that comes back to your site can actually, uh, can actually have it in, its ca in, in the cache of the browser. Uh, and obviously, no, a number of rules here. I encourage you to uh, explore them. And I encourage you to also like, look at 
uh, some of the documentation. So the easiest way to get to the documentation is just to press on the rule. Because once you see a rule and you go like, I don't understand what this rule is, just press on the rule. And we have a lot of documentation. All, this, all the documentation open source. And we, we try to be very descriptive about what the problem is and how you can resolve it. So going back to, uh, going back to our presentation. Brian? Yep. So let's look at w one example of, of why speed mind development matters. Uh, so for, for each of those page speed suggestions, why is it important that you adopt that, that uh, you know, suggestion? You apply it to your site. What, what is it doing? How is it making the site faster? So we'll look at one specific example, which we talked a little bit about earlier around parallelization, so the ordering of styles and scripts. So here's an example ahead of an HTML web page. What we've got is sort of some interspersed CSS and JavaScript content. It looks reasonable enough. Uh, but in fact, in some browsers, what you'll see is that uh, Intermixing CSS and JavaScript like this, so you know some CSS, some JavaScript, some CSS, introduces additional serialization delays in the page load. So what, what you get is you get the two uh, the CSS and the JavaScript file will load. You get another delay on the next JavaScript file, and then the final two CSS files load. And it turns out, so so what you're looking at here is roughly 300 milliseconds. In this example, if it's a 100 millisecond round trip, so. Um, turns out that if you just reorder these things, so you put all the CSS up front followed by the JavaScript, uh, the browser can more efficiently, or some browsers anyway, uh, more efficiently will fetch that content and you'll be able to re uh, remove one of the round trip times. So this is an example where it's an easy fix, an easy thing to do. All of our suggestions, this one and all of our suggestions, won't have any, shouldn't have any impact on the look and feel of your page. So as far as the user is concerned, the page is exactly the same. Uh, and then finally, uh, what you get is you know you reduce one of those round trip times and go from the 300 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds without any other change in the page. So over the last, we launched in June. Yeah. So it's been about a year, and over the last year we've uh, been you know working hard on a number of things. Um, we've added some new rules and fixed some others, and we just wanted to talk about a few of them just to give some examples. Uh, so we added a rule called minimize request size uh, within the last year. And the idea there is that uh, each request that the browser makes has some overhead, and there are things you can do, uh, reducing cookie size, reducing um, the length of the URL, in fact, uh, can keep that request size small so that it fits within a single TCP packet and uh, is more likely to be transmitted efficiently and quickly over the network. And that's especially important in mobile, uh, because mobile tends to have uh, high latency and asymmetric bandwidth where you've got you know, a slower up than a downlink. So uh, next, specify a cache validator is a new rule that we added actually pretty recently. And the idea there is that for static content, for static resources, uh, once they do expire, so if you set an expiration of a week or a month or a year, once they do expire, it's possible for the browser to ask the server, hey, you know, I have this resource. It's not fresh anymore. It's not... I, I, it's not uh, it's expired. Has it changed? And the server can say, nope, it hasn't changed. You can update it and keep it for another week, for instance. Using a cache validator allows you to do that. Otherwise, you have to download the entire resource again, even if it hasn't changed. So that's a rule we've added. Uh, specify a character set early. Uh, it, it turns out that if, you, you know, if you're serving HTML content uh, and you don't specify the character set, so UTF-8 or ship gist or whatever it might be, the browser has to guess as to what the character set is. And in order to do that, it buffers content in, its, in, in memory before it actually starts parsing it. So the browser is downloading the content. It's being served from the, uh, the server as quickly as possible. But uh, the user is not seeing anything on the screen until it finishes buffering, analyzes all that content to guess the character set, which it could possibly guess wrong. And uh, you know, only at that point does it start rendering content. So just specifying a character set and HTTP response headers, you know, content type text, HTML, semicolon, char set equals whatever it might be, uh, allows the browser to more efficiently parse and render the content as it comes, as it arrives on the wire. And then finally, minimize DNS lookups is a rule that we implemented initially based on analyzing some pages internally, a uh, long time ago, in fact. And uh, what we noticed is that for certain sites and for certain content, third-party content, it tended to flag those resources uh, and sort of say, you know, you should, uh, it, it would flag resources that we felt we probably shouldn't be flagging. So we spent some time and just recently looked at the algorithm and tuned that algorithm so that uh, 
it, it doesn't flat, it, it's, it's basically more accurate and gives uh, more accurate recommendations. So actually, we just released PageSpeed 1.8, which has a new implementation to minimize DNS lookups uh, that is more accurate and less likely to give you sort of incorrect suggestions. So we're constantly tuning these rules. We're constantly adding new rules, both as we find issues, either ourselves or from feedback um, from users. So we'll send you a link to the PageSpeed discussion forum uh, at the end of the talk. And then, um, right, uh, yes. So, go ahead, Richard. So, uh, a bunch of new features, and today we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the export fun functionality. It's basically a beacon that uh, you can send, uh, and I'll just go through the demo directly. So, let's go back here. And so we have, of course. Uh, right. <laughs> so we have export functionality that will allow us to export. Uh, Do you want to reload? Uh, yeah, well, that's fine. Or switch browsers. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to start. Okay, switch uh, to Safari. Like I said, we're always finding and fixing problems. So. Yeah. So basically, we have two export functionalities. And one, we, we send the data back in JSON format. And we also send the scores to www.showslow.com. If, if you guys want to try it, if you have uh, page feeds running, just send it out. You're going to have a bit of a legal disclaimer. Uh, we worked with this outside uh, you know, independent developer uh, who maintains showslow.com. And basically, uh, it gives you uh, a way of uh, keeping track of your page feed score across uh, across time, and in this case, I'm showing uh, an example of, I believe, Google.com and YouTube.com and Gmail.com and measurements that we're sending to Showslow. So when you're doing the development, you change some of your, uh, you know, you you adapt to the web page to be more performant, and you can track the performance of your page across, across time. Uh, so I encourage you to use this. Uh, it's a great functionality. Uh, don't hit showslow.com with too many, <laughs> too many beacons at the same time. Uh, do you want to show the site? Show the, do you want to build it? Oh, yeah. So the, the actual site uh, here is uh, here's the site. Uh, YSlow is a competitor to PageSpeed. Uh, we encourage you to use as many performance tools as available as you can, you can try out. And in this case, what we, uh, uh, wh what, uh, we did earlier is uh, we sent a bunch of uh, requests, a uh, uh, bunch of beacons to showslow.com, and it records them right here. Uh, so you can keep track of them. And uh, you can, these are the comparisons. So Google.com and YouTube.com are here, and you can see over time the uh, the performance of your page, obviously. Okay, so let's go to the next feature, Brian. So, so one of the things we've been working on over the past year is uh, the PageSpeed SDK. So. At the time of our initial launch. PageSpeed was entirely a JavaScript implementation. It was, pretty, it was tightly coupled to Firefox APIs. And what we found was that we wanted to reuse the PageSpeed logic in other environments. So one, air, one spot, one place early on that we said we'd like to provide this is in Google Webmaster Tools. How many are, is it, how many are familiar with Google Webmaster Tools? Great. So hopefully, maybe you've seen uh, that there are PageSpeed suggestions, actually, in the Webmaster Tools UI in the lab section. And if you haven't used Webmaster Tools before, I would definitely encourage you to check it out. It's a, a great resource with lots of uh, good, helpful information for your website. Assuming you have a website, you can sign up and, and learn about your site on that site. So what we did was we, over time, over the last you know, nine months, we've been porting uh, rules from the JavaScript uh, space to a sort of browser-independent library implemented in C++ that we're able to reuse in PageSpeed for Firefox, uh, in Webmaster Tools, and in other environments as well. So you can now download that SDK, um, use it. We've got a build set up for Linux and for Windows. And if you want to build on Mac, I don't think it'll take much work. Uh, so we'd, if, you figure, <laughs> if you figure out what small changes to make to the make file in order to get that to work, we'd 
definitely uh, feel free to share that with us and we'd be uh, more than happy to include it in our open source uh, repository. So I mentioned Webmaster Tools. Do you wanna um, yeah. display that? Uh, this is one of the, the um, places where PageSpeed is available today. And so here's, here's an example of Webmaster Tools. You can sort of see, um, right, that this is uh, the YouTube uh, area of Webmaster Tools, which we we're able to see. Um, and it gives you some example feedback for some pages on your site. So you can drill down and, for instance, see, you know, that these four rules have specific suggestions to help you tune and optimize the site. Um, you know, here, for example, uh, is real combine external JavaScript, which you can learn more about in our documentation uh, Richard showed earlier. Uh, but the idea is that uh, if you combine these two resources, the browser uh, will be able to load the page more efficiently, uh, at least in some browsers. So uh, now not only do you have access to page speed suggestions in the Firefox tool, you can just go to this website, Webmaster Tools, Google Webmaster Tools, and uh, get this information without having to install an extension, without having to you know, run it live on your site. This data is just provided for you as part of the Google Webmaster Tools service. So in addition, we've actually, you know, so we've worked with a couple other uh, tools as well. This is the PageSpeed for Firefox UI. PageSpeed for Firefox is now uh, driven off of the PageSpeed SDK as well. Uh, Gomez, a web performance company we've been working with, uh, also integrated the PageSpeed SDK rule set, and they're providing that in their tools. And this is a pre-release. They haven't actually launched this yet, but this is something that'll be coming soon. And then <coughs> Steve Souders, excuse me, Steve Souders uh, built a nice uh, web page where you can take a HAR file, a HAR file is an HTTP archive file, sort of a new JSON format that lets you capture uh, all the information about uh, a page load, so all the resource content, headers, timing information. You post that into this web page, it uses the PageSpeed SDK and comes back and gives you a PageSpeed score. So these are just a few deployments. We launched the SDK about a month ago. And uh, we've seen great uptake. And we, well, let's do a, um, a little bit of a deep dive into the SDK now <clears throat> to see uh, how you might use it. So if you wanted to use the PageSpeed SDK, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You just need to choose an output formatter, sort of how do you want to present the results? Do you want just plain text, HTML, JSON, et cetera? Pick the PageSpeed rules you'd like to run. Specify a source of your input data, so for instance, HAR or some other uh, you know, input source, and then just invoke the engine. So let's look at a snippet of code that does that now. <coughs> so we're choosing to use a text format or just something that we'll print to standard out in this case. And we're populating the core rule set, the core page speed rule set, so the rules that you're familiar with in the tool. Uh, we're gonna use a har file as our input. So this is an example har, har is a JSON format. The dot, dot, dot would be a big blob of content that contains all the resource bodies and other things. And then finally, we'll invoke the PageSpeed engine. So pass it the rules, initialize, compute and format results. And at this point, the results will be printed to the standard out uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the console. So let's look at that, actually. So one of the tools bundled with the PageSpeed SDK is called Hard to Page Speed, which is actually the tool that powers the Hard to Page Speed website that Steve built. And you invoke it. You, essentially, the code we just looked at is the core, the guts of that tool. It's you know it got the ability to read a file from a command line argument, but beyond that, I mean, it's essentially what we just looked at. And so you run it like this, very simple, right? Now you're not in a browser anymore. You're on the command line, different different environment, and you're able to get that same information, those same results here on the console easily and quickly. And you, you know, so potentially you could write an automation uh, tool that used something like this to automatically analyze HAR files over time, all without having to stand up a browser and run PageSpeed and that sort of thing. So we can learn specifically what we can do to speed up the web page. So that's the PageSpeed SDK. Now let's look at Another deployment of PageSpeed technology that we've been working on, it's sort of, it's very early in the life cycle of the project, but uh, what we decided we wanted to do is try to shift as much as possible from telling web developers what they can do to speed up their site and just actually try to do that for them. So essentially, 
So what we, well, what we decided to do was implement an Apache module that en encapsulates a lot of these page speed suggestions. So all you have to do is install this module on your Apache server, and then you don't have to think about the problem anymore, ideally. Uh, we just automatically optimize uh, you know, the images, the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript, combine resources, extend caching lifetimes, uh, using a technique called uh, resource fingerprinting, uh, which is talked about in our documentation as well. All these things are captured automatically, so you don't have to go to the trouble of implementing them, uh, or, do, or web uh, content hosters don't have to do that, and they can just sort of have this applied automatically. So this project is open source as well. Uh, like I said, it's early in the development cycle, so it's not ready for use yet, but if you're interested, take a look at our co uh, code.google.com repository. So the question is? Does it insert semicolons uh, at the end of lines? I don't know, actually. Uh, I want to say, so the, it the I actually don't think it preserves the new line, so it would need to insert semicolons. So, so that's actually a good example of yeah. um, uh, a case If you can where, repeat the question, because. Yeah, so, so he asked if it, uh, retains semicolons at the end of new lines, because one of the things JavaScript minifiers do is they tend to remove new, new lines. JavaScript new lines implicitly add a semicolon, so if you just combine the two lines, you can end up with JavaScript that breaks. I want to say we do fix that, but I'd have to double check. In any case, if, if you run into a problem, um, do you, know, you can actually go to the same URL and file an issue or uh, post on our discussion forum. Um, and you know, we'd be happy to. We're always happy to accept code patches if you're interested in, in submitting patches, uh, or you know, we'll try to fix the issue ourselves for a subsequent release. So here's an example of you know, as the HTML flows through Apache, uh, you know, sort of uh, you know, coming in unoptimized, uh, like this perhaps, uh, we'll you know parse that HTML and uh, perform some optimizations, and what you end up with is HTML that's a little more minified and is serving fewer resources. So what we've done here is we've combined the two CSS resources, we've combined the two JavaScript resources. What you can't see here is we would have also extended caching lifetimes and removed uh, unnecessary white space along so the way. Before you move on, why don't you talk a little bit about the extension of caching lifetime? Because it's quite interesting. Oh, sure. So one thing that we'll often find is that um, caching lifetimes are either unspecified or set sort of not very aggressively, on some sites anyway. and. Uh, Developers um, are sometimes concerned that, well, if I extend it for a week or a year, what if I need to change that resource? And so what we recommend is a technique we call uh, fingerprinting, URL fingerprinting, essentially, uh, which looks at the actual content of the resource and embeds that fingerprint in the URL. So what you're looking at here is slash cache slash some blob, that makes no sense, right, uh, .css. And what that actually is is an, part of an MD5 sum of the concatenation of a.css a and b.css. So now, because we've sort of captured a fingerprint of the actual contents in the URL, we can use a really aggressive caching lifetime. We can set this thing to not expire for a year. And then if it does happen to change, well, the contents will change, the fingerprint will change, and uh, in turn, the URL will change, right? So the browser will know, oh, I have to go fetch this other resource which has a different URL that's not in my cache. So this lets you sort of, instead of specifying how long the browser is, you basically can expire the resource when it expires. Instead of having to wait for that expiration time, you just change the URL, and uh, the browser will download it as soon as the URL changes. So that's a technique we'll do. It, it's, it's a bit of a fragile technique. You know, you have to sort of match up the content signatures with actual URLs in the content, which you can do um, by hand, or if you use Mod PageBee, we'll do that for you automatically. So that's Mod PageSpeed. So, so PageSpeed came out of uh, you know, Google Labs. We, we spent a lot of time trying to understand uh, optimization of UI at Google. We, we built a lot of these rules internally. And after we, we released it as open source about a year ago, just like Brian said, uh, we got a lot of good feedback. And one of the, you know, one of the most important pieces of feedback is, a website is not usually coming from one, uh, you know, one property. There's, there's content that, for example, for a publisher, there's, a con there's content that the reporter is writing, 
there's the ad systems that are that are you know that you're shipping so that you can monetize your your uh, your your pages and there's also tracking analytics that you need to so that you can keep track of uh, measurements and all the metrics that you care about so we spent a lot of time trying to understand how to adjust this and our approach is, is to try to give as much information back to the developer as possible. And uh, to do that, we basically started focusing as a, as a first step in terms of like third party content on ads and trackers. And I'll show the demo. Uh, so this is the YouTube page. And I'm going to start Firebug. This is PageFeed. And there is a filter option with these, these options. The first one is analyze ads only, analyze trackers only, content only, and the complete page. The complete page is what you're used to when you run PageBeat, for, the, for those of you that have run it. And now what we're going to do is we're going to filter only the ads and try to, and try to see what, the, what, what we're going to get in terms of that. So I'm go first going to analyze the performance for the complete page. Uh, I get a bunch of rules. Obviously, there's a lot of recommendations for just about every rule. Uh, and then I'm going to analyze the ads only. If I refresh the analysis, you can see that all these rules are not applicable anymore. And what we're, uh, what we're looking at is specifically uh, the ad content. And so we have a number of filters. Uh, for, for uh, what we think are ads. And by the way, all the, all the filters are open source. So if you have suggestions for adding more, uh, we know today we're not very, uh, we don't have a lot of coverage internationally. So it'll be good to have more international coverage for uh, you know, ads uh, systems, ads networks that uh, you know, we don't capture today. Uh, and you'll see, like you know, double click is being served on YouTube, but obviously it's a, it's a, it's an ad, and we're going to give you recommendations about this ad. Uh, the same thing happens for analytics, although I don't believe that YouTube has, uh, you know, analytics on their on their pages. So what this will give you is enough information to understand how uh, third-party content is affecting the performance of your pages. Well, we're going to extend it to gadgets. We believe gadgets are becoming a big, uh, a big part of every web page, and we uh, we think it's important for every web developer to actually understand the impact of uh, all the content that they have, and understand the impact of things that they can they have control over versus things they don't have control over, and make the right decision. And every every development is a is a is a balance between adding more features and first thinking about uh, speed as a feature. And we're, we're sure you can find the balance there. Uh, with, with this, we, we hope that giving all this information will, will also spur uh, third party content to actually try to make sure that they are optimal so that when they're served uh, out of your web pages, they are, they are fast and uh, performant. And this is a feature we just added in. Uh... So we just released it this morning. Yep. Uh, we just pushed it out. It's in beta. 10% uh, of uh, yeah. all so our users are getting it uh, as so of this morning. You may get it uh, automatically if you have PageBeat installed. But if not, you can go to the PageBeat download page and download the PageBeat beta, and you'll get that feature as part of that download. And so it's a new feature. So give us feedback uh, online on the dis discussion list. It will be great. And. Obviously, I just covered this. Future work. Yep. So looking forward, I'll talk about a few of the rules that we're thinking about uh, adding to the rule set over the coming months. Uh, I'll talk about three rules. Uh, the first is to recommend uh, using chunked encoding. So chunked encoding is a technique that allows you to send a page in pieces, as opposed to sending the whole thing after generating the whole thing. Uh, and this actually relates to the bit I talked about at the beginning, where, you know, uh, server latency, uh, what do we call it, server processing time can add to the page load. Oftentimes, if you use chunked encoding, you'll mitigate or even eliminate uh, that, uh, that as far as the user is concerned. What it lets you do is essentially send uh, this, 
So the assumption is that most pages that are dynamic, search results pages, uh, user customized pages, like uh, email websites, et cetera, have sort of a static bit of content at the head of the page that doesn't uh, take anything to compute. It's essentially just a static string. And the idea is that you send that as the first chunk of the response. While you're doing that, you start computing the actual dynamic data the user requested. And what you have is in parallel, you're sending uh, you know, that static data on the wire while you're computing the user's result. And then as soon as that uh, dynamic content is generated and ready to serve, you serve it right behind as a separate chunk. And as far as the, depending on the user's connection, it may just look like a, 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 a consistent stream of data that actually was never interrupted. Uh, so chunked encoding, so the, I should say the default behavior in HTTP is to specify the length of the response in the response headers. The response headers come before the entire response body. So by default, you have to wait and buffer the entire response, the entire dynamic response, uh, before you start sending any of it. So chunked encoding lets you do this in chunks, you know, send that static header first and the dynamic body uh, afterwards. And you know, what we see is that this has been a big win for Google properties like search and calendar that have fit that constraint of dynamic response with a static header. And so, whoops. So what we'll see oftentimes is that before implementing this kind of technique, you'll have this HTTP waterfall chart you know, that shows the, a timeline of the resources being downloaded. It looks something like this. HTML, you'll, take, you'll spend a lot of time downloading that HTML resource. Towards the end of that download, you'll start downloading the sub-resources declared in that content. And once you enable chunking, what you get is, so one nice side effect of this is that external JavaScript and CSS are oftentimes declared in that static chunk. So by sending that static chunk much sooner, you pull in those sub-resource fetches consi uh, considerably and allow the browser to start uh, downloading, parsing, and applying those resources much earlier in the page load. So this is a useful technique for dynamic uh, responses. So second, minimize the size of early loaded resources. And the idea here is that browsers have become much more efficient at downloading resources, uh, specifically JavaScript. A year ago, most browsers out there would download uh, JavaScript serially, they'd sort of, you know, if you had 10 JavaScript files declared in a row, would download one, wait for it to finish, parse it, execute it, move on, download the next one, and you saw this stair step in the waterfall chart. So what we're seeing now with the modern browsers, all the modern browsers, all the major browser vendors have implemented this, is that you get parallelized JavaScript fetches, much more efficient use of the network, but regardless, the browser can't show anything to, to the user until all of those resources have been downloaded and all of the JavaScript has been parsed and executed, CSS as well. So the less you serve up front, the less you serve in the head of the page, and the more you can defer to later in the page until after content has been rendered, uh, the faster that initial flash of content, that initial uh, sort of time to first paint will be, and the, fast, the less time the user is sort of sitting there staring, waiting at a blank screen. So you can actually accomplish this technique today using two of our rules in the PageSpeed rule set in Firefox. Uh, remove unused CSS and defer loading of JavaScript, which will help you to understand which JavaScript and CSS are actually used on your page and which, uh, which are, are not until later. Um, we're going to sort of, uh, what this rule will do is sort of streamline that process a little bit to make it a little easier to uh, apply the technique. And then finally, minimize, minimize fetches from JavaScript. So as browsers have become more efficient in the last 12 months and they've parallelized JavaScript fetches, uh, what we've seen is that JavaScript that's fetched using JavaScript still gets serialized. So we pay a penalty for fetching JavaScript uh, from JavaScript. So, so sometimes JavaScript libraries, you'll see this in a lot of actually major websites, uh, will you know, do something like this, very straightforward, write a couple script tags. And then they'll use some JavaScript library to load a couple of these JavaScript resources. Seems pretty reasonable. But what this does in the modern browsers, traditionally this actually had no latency impact. And a year ago, most browsers, it didn't make a difference because it was just gonna be fetched serially whether you fetched it using JavaScript or whether you fetched it using a script tag. And so what happens here is that the browser uses sort of a, a speculative fetcher, so it goes and parses ahead of the renderer, looks for tags and says, oh, I found a script tag, okay, foo.js, I'll fetch that. Parses ahead, parses ahead, hits a script tag, it says, well, I'm just a speculative fetcher, I don't actually execute JavaScript. So I can't do anything about this one, skip it. Then eventually the renderer receives foo.js, uh, js, common.js, and effects.js, parses and executes those, and says, okay, next I'll execute that script block, because it executes scripts in order. 
And what this ends up looking like is that stair-stepping behavior that you saw in older browsers, the serialized JavaScript fetches. So if you've got JavaScript fetched in this way in your page, and it's easy to just turn them into script tags, you'll go from that serialized JavaScript fetching to parallel JavaScript fetching, uh, making your page uh, display its content sooner uh, than it otherwise would. So then finally, I'll let Richard talk. So a lot of the development for PageSpeed happened uh, early on when we didn't have Chrome, we didn't have developer tools. And the past year, we've been focused a lot on the rules and the, uh, the correctness of the rules and building that, uh, that uh, you know, the SDK. Uh, we're going to be uh, you know, releasing a version of PageSpeed for Chrome with integration with Chrome developer tools. And we're hoping to get it at the end, by the end of this year. Uh, we know it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty high request by everybody. Uh, we apologize for like, not having been able to do it earlier, but developer tools are now such a complete uh, developer environment for us that we, you know, we're, we're going to be uh, you know, landing, in the, landing in Chrome in the, you know, this year. Uh, so uh, where can you get more information? A bunch of places. So uh, we have a very developed uh, uh, website, uh, thanks to our wonderful tech writer. So everything is at code.google.com slash speed slash page speed. We, we have uh, all our development is in open source. We don't do any development uh, uh, you know, in the sandbox somewhere. Uh, do contribute if you'd like to contribute. Uh, there's also uh, you know, bug, you know, just as, uh, asking for features and bugs is great. And it's a pretty active mailing list that you can subscribe to and help us make the product better and tell us about success stories using PageSpeed or problems of how you use PageSpeed and how it didn't you know, per perform so we can make it better. Uh, thank you. So let's see if we have anything on, on moderator to cover. And if you have questions. And if you have questions, please, the microphone is here. Thank you.